Today we're studying together two chapters, 16 and 17, of the book of Joshua. And we'll need to open our Bibles to follow the detail. One of the interesting things about apparently boring bits of the Bible like this is to notice the clever tricks the authors play with their information. We've already noticed this in the previous chapters of Joshua, and it's evident again here. In chapter 15 we were provided with an enormous amount of detail as to the allocation of land to Judah. It included, for example, a description of the boundaries as well as the specific allocations of towns and villages. In these two chapters, however, the former are described most sketchily, and the latter are not mentioned at all. Instead, the account seems first of all to focus upon the final verses of each chapter in verses in chapter 16, 10 and 17, 18, verses that appear designed to echo 1563. Secondly, the beginning and end of the passage includes two cameo stories in 17, 3 to 6 and 17, 14 to 18 that contrast with one another. And thirdly, the latter story seems to pointedly contrast with 15, 13 to 19 and 19, 49 to 50, passages which form part of the introduction and conclusion of this major section of Joshua. Here then is the work of an artist with words and art with a purpose, since such patterns throw light upon the reasons why the story is told. The prominence afforded to Judah in chapter 15 is to be understood in the light of the Messianic promise of Genesis 49, 9 and the following verses. And verses 1 to 4 also gain focus in the light of the deathbed scenes of Jacob. In Genesis 48 the birth order of Manasseh and Ephraim was set aside by a divine oracle. The divine order is followed here. It prompts Davis to comment that while the author does not ring any bells about it, it's just a reminder, another hint of Yahweh's strange ways. How often the divine way reverses the conventions of men, overthrows the human canons of what ought to be. That's why the good God of the Bible is so stimulating and refreshing. He's never a prisoner of what fallen man regards as normal. Again and again he turns human standards on their heads, causing us to wonder and cheer. And that is reason to adore him. So first of all, Ephraim's allotment is briefly recorded in verses 5 to 10. However, we begin to recognise something of an emerging chorus line in verse 10. We're told they did not dislodge the Canaanites living in Giza. This compares with 1563, but here there is the added detail that they live among the people of Ephraim, but are required to do forced labour. There's just a hint here, therefore, that the decision was a commercial one. This way, the Ephraimites could improve their standard of living. Such would, however, have dire consequences, as Deuteronomy 7 verses 1 to 5 warned, and Giza would never be fully subjugated for centuries, not until 1 Kings chapter 9 verse 16. Here then were a people uh, who failed to seize the moment. They found a better route to satisfy themselves than obey the Lord's commands and use God's blessing as an opportunity to march to their own tune. Rather than rejoice in God's grace and renew their faithful commitment to him, they were seduced into believing that the Lord's blessing justified their unsanctified strategies. Chapter 17 verses 1 to 3 is almost an exact parallel of 16, 5 to 10. Here the allotment of the half-tribe of Manasseh is concluded with a similar but even more serious failure in verses 12 and 13. They too subjected the Canaanites to forced labour. However, the problem was that they were determined to live in that region, and the faith and resolve of the Manassehites was generally unable to match the determination of the inhabitants of the land. Thus even the subjugation of the Canaanites was a partial and temporary thing. The result was inevitable syncretism. Faith in the Lord rendered weak, the hold on true religion frail, and the development of a powerless religion the inevitable result. Perhaps we detect here a further problem that has been noted elsewhere. The people may have been effective in the sprint, 
but they were poor at the marathon. The latter can be boring, unsatisfying, and the crowds may have gone home by the time the race is completed. But faith is demonstrated far more in the long haul than the adrenaline-driven crisis or project. Here the Manassehites signally failed. But not all of them. Embedded in this narrative of partial success amid faithlessness is the story of the daughters of Zelophehad in verses 3 to 6. And what a glowing example it provides among the encircling gloom. The background of this story is found in Numbers 27, 1 to 11. And here we are introduced, however, not to a great leader of the land like Caleb, but a specific family, names and all, of disadvantaged, marginalised and otherwise vulnerable women who plead the promise of God through Moses. Yet, like Caleb before them, who also went to Joshua in verse 4 and compare 14.6, they demonstrate their faith and a forthrightness to please Yahweh's past word. When the Lord speaks, he addresses all sorts and conditions of people, and when he speaks he expects faith to be exercised, from the greatest to the most insignificant. The final little story is about the other half-tribe of Manasseh, who are here further defined as descendants of Joseph. It's told with the skill of a consummate storyteller, and it all sounds so plausible, even spiritual. We are a numerous people, and the Lord has blessed us abundantly, they say in verse 14. In fact, a comparison with Numbers 26 suggests that this was an overstatement. The population numbers of Ephraim and the half-tribe of Manasseh probably amounted to no more than 60,000, whereas Judah at 76,000 and even Dan, 64,300 and Issachar of the same size were bigger. Moreover, Manasseh's allocation included some of the most fertile territory in Palestine. The Vale of Sharon was the breadbasket of Palestine and had sufficient resources to feed all the tribes. The problem was that to possess this land required hard graft and danger. Such was also true of the upland reason, reasons. Uh, thus, it is probably best to translate the hill country is not enough for us in verse 16 as, in fact, we cannot acquire the forests. In other words, it requires too much effort. One other little subtlety seems present here. Joshua is asked, why have you given us only one allotment? In verse 14. Joshua himself was a descendant of Joseph, a member of the tribe of Ephraim. Indeed, he will take up residence in his hill country in chapter 19, verses 49 and 50. It appears then that the people may be suggesting that the half-tribe should therefore receive preferential treatment from a fellow Josephite, whatever the Lord might apportion. Perhaps better, however, the words may imply that since the Lord had singled out their forefather Joseph in the past, they should be given preferential treatment as God's favourite now. God's grace is therefore seen as a ground for preferment and status, rather than an encouragement to greater fidelity. Not surprisingly, Joshua cuts through the cant. If God has blessed them and they are so numerous, then he tells them, go up into the forest and clear land for yourselves, in verse 15. He acknowledges that this may not be easy. Forest clearance is, is arduous, and after all, this is the territory of the Perizzites and the Rephites, who have iron chariots and are strong, as Joshua recognises in verse 18. Nevertheless, in the face of their continuing whinging, he argues that since they are very powerful, they surely have the ability to have not only one allotment, but the forested hill country as well. Thus he exposes their fear to venture on God, that they were clothing in pious clichés. Consequently, the half-tribe of Manasseh were challenged to recognise, as one puts it, that God is not prisoner of human odds, that his promises are at least as real as the iron plating on Canaanite chariots, but that we will see little of his power until we venture out into the way of obedience, until we trust his promise enough to walk in it.